Hello and welcome to Here's to Your Health. I'm your host, Veggie Patty, and it's my pleasure to bring you information on healthy living. On today's episode, I have a friend of mine who I met several years ago, and she's going to talk to us today about assisting survivors of domestic violence. So I'd like to welcome Kaylin Risker to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, yes, you're very welcome. I'm so glad that you were able to come on the me show. Too. Now, you founded an organization called SAFE, which stands for Sisters Acquiring Financial Empowerment. Yes. So can you tell us what is SAFE? What is SAFE? Well, SAFE um, is an organization that specifically helps survivors of domestic violence to overcome or to leave from a domestic violence situation. But in order to do it, kind of learn how to manage your finances or to get resources. So what happens is there's a thing that people aren't familiar with. People are often familiar with, you know, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, and physical abuse. And that's just through the work over the last 30 plus years of the domestic violence movement that people are beginning to be familiar with that. But those are actually just some of the components that comprise an intimate partner relationship or domestic violence and, and some of the things that can be seen. So SAFE specifically works with economic abuse. And that's a new word that people aren't as familiar with. Economic abuse is where a partner restricts the victim, where the abuser restricts the victim from working, from having access to their own finances if they are working, their name isn't on the house or the car or the credit cards, the bank account, they aren't allowed to go to school, they aren't allowed to have access or they're restricted from having access from any economic resources that would then allow them to move forward independently. So what happens when a victim decides that they want to leave or they need to not make that transition or even they just want to be able to care for their children. There was at least a couple of participants of our program whose um, partner would give them $20 a week allowance that they would have to figure out a way to feed their kids and for gas to get back and forth to take the kids to school. And that's just not enough. So even if for those <clears throat> to help them while they're still in the situation or how they can maximize where they are. And so oftentimes economic abuse isn't a standalone component of domestic violence. It's also seen with some of the other elements, isolation, intimidation, threats, threatening the children, things of that nature, the physical, mental, emotional. But our organization, we strictly you know, try to focus, that's our niche is specifically with that and, and helping to overcome the effects of uh, economic abuse, even for those that then leave. You have um, situations where the abuser has done credit ID theft and have done things with their credit cards and bank accounts and, and things of that nature. And so now they have to fix the credit report and try to get back on track. Okay, great. And that's something that, you know, like you said, a lot of people don't realize that, and it could be standalone, but it also could be part of a larger domestic violence. and. You know, people, it's a form of control, obviously, is Correct. they don't, they're preventing their partner from being able to leave that situation. At least they feel that that's what they're doing, is they're controlling it to the point where, well, there's no hope for you to leave, and they're trying to take that away. And so you guys are there to assist them, to show them that there is a way for them to get out. And that's great that you guys Thank are doing you. that, and that somebody is, is offering that service. So can you tell us, how did SAFE get started? Okay, well, SAFE actually started in 2006, but why it got started is the part that people often, you know, like, how did you even think to start mm -hmm. this organization? Because I am the founder of the organization, and so um, my story is that in 1998, I was in a relationship for seven and a half years, and at that time, we had a daughter, and she was four and a half, and we had a life together, and we lived together, and... Um, you know, there were a lot of other components of domestic violence, but I wasn't educated and there wasn't a lot of education and awareness being done in 1998. And I didn't realize how things were escalating. And so Labor Day weekend of that year, things escalated to the point to where he shattered my left eye socket. And um, I have a titanium implant that replaces the bone under my eye. And so that was very traumatic, you know, as everyone around me could see the physical evidence of the trauma. But what they didn't um, understand was a lot of the other things that I was going through. 
you know. So, of course, you know, there was a lot of mental and emotional abuse behind that. How could this happen? But there was also a big economic component because he was the primary breadwinner and um, I didn't have short-term disability or I just worked a part-time job at the time. I didn't have um, a way to get back on my feet. So it was really, really a challenge for me to try to do that when I couldn't even see mm -hmm. and I had to heal and go through these various surgeries. But um, I really relied on my own faith to kind of get me through that time and my tenacity and creativity, I'll say. So after I had a few surgeries and I started to get like back on my feet and started to just be independent, even though I'm kind of against the doctor's order. So my doctor wouldn't actually give me a return to work note mm -hmm. because I still had double vision. And I was just like, I need to work, I need to generate some kind of funds for myself so what I ended up doing was I ended up quitting my job and I started working a new job and 98 jobs were a lot more plentiful and so this new job because new, new jobs don't ask for a return to work note and a fitness to work you know mm -hmm. so I started working this job and it was a payroll job and I was messing up paychecks because I had like this double vision action going on and you know so I had some problems on the job but you know I just stuck with it and I ended up you know, working my way up into human resources. I went back to school. I got a scholarship that's for survivors of domestic violence to return to school. It's through the Women's Independent Scholarship Program. That's still a program that's around help survivors. And, um, and I ended up loving it. But what happened was I ended up working as a human resource administrator over at HMO in Detroit. And during my experience there, I met different women and saw how domestic violence affected them. And these women were from vice presidents down on down entry level positions. It wasn't a lot of them, but it was a few. And I saw how it was, it was a lot for the percentage of the employees that worked there. Mm -hmm. And I saw how not only it affected them personally, but I saw how it affected their coworkers. I saw how it affected one woman from getting a job, you know, or it made it challenging because she called me. She said, I'm having a hard time getting a job. I don't even know what to do. I'm just trying to get a job in housekeeping. And this is why my resume has all these gaps in it and, and short work histories. And I just call you and telling you that I'm in, I'm in this abusive situation. I'm trying to get out. I just need a job so I can get some money and get an apartment. And that was my first time I really thought about it. Like, wow, because that wasn't quite my experience. And I hadn't mm -hmm. really, you know, you kind of know your own experience, but it's harder for you to step out of it and think about the different ways that it can kind of manifest itself. So I'm looking at that, and then I'm also, because I'm in the Human Resources Department, I have a unique perspective of seeing how it affected the coworkers. So coworkers concerned about their, their fellow coworker who's coming in with the black eye. And, and that causes some productivity, morale issues when their coworkers are calling off and now they have to take on more work. And then I saw how it affected the company because the cost for rehiring someone, recruiting, retraining, a new staff person, um, how much it cost the company to hire a new security guard, to walk people to their cars because someone was being stalked to install in a new security system. So from my personal experience and my professional experiences where SAFE was born in 2006, and since then we've helped over 850 survivors of domestic violence in the metropolitan Detroit area. That's great, that's really great. And I think what you're saying there, I mean, it's very profound and, and people, people think of domestic violence as a private matter. Mm -hmm. And if they're not involved with it, they feel bad that the situation is occurring, but they always think, well, it doesn't affect me, it's a private right. matter. But part of what you're saying is that it actually impacts the whole community. Correct. And So that was just like a slice of in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And they say that domestic violence costs U.S. employers over $14 billion a year in higher insurance deductibles and uh, higher insurance premiums, the absenteeism, the re you know, recidivism costs, the, I mean, just all of those costs. That's a lot of money, $13 billion on a, a workforce and, and jobs that are already stretched financially. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, it also impacts the schools. You have children that are traumatized and that are seeing this violence in their home and they're coming to school and they're not their highest product, 
you know, they're not working at their highest self. Right. And then they sometimes may act out in school, and then that causes a distraction in the classroom from your child being educated. People don't understand how, you know, it, it, it can drain the, the public services, the police departments, the emergency rooms, things of that nature because of domestic violence and how it does affect everyone. So even if it doesn't affect you personally as it is happening to you, it's still happening in your community and you're still affected by it. So that's why everyone really should care. Right, and that's, um, like I said, that's very profound and I know some people may not have thought of it that way before, mm -hmm. um, but I hope that now the viewers actually do think of it in that way, that this is a community problem. This is yes, something is. that everybody can do something about this instead of just turning a blind eye. Um, you know, find out how you can become involved. Definitely. So, so tell us, with your organization, if somebody wanted to become involved with, with you guys, I know that you have a lot of volunteers. Yes. How can people be involved with your organization on the volunteer side of things? Well, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities at SAFE. I mean, everything from telemarketing, which is a huge piece of what we do, and that's everything from calling our clients to let them know that about our weekly sessions. Because, you know, when people are really going through a transition, they want to do better. They want to do things. But if, if you have a lot of turmoil going in your home, you might forget, oh, wow, there's a workshop or there's something great happening over at state, even though I really wanted to go and I forget about it. So us calling them to remind them, they're like, they feel special for one thing that we took the time to call them and then make the extra effort to come out. So that's one huge thing that we do as well as our community events. We definitely need um, qualified experienced trainers as well. Sometimes people might train, they might be really skilled in an area and do a quarterly training on a, around a specific topic. And then we have some people that, you know, want to train every week or every month or something and get really involved in the work that we do. Some people just want to come and serve because we, we give, um, the participants of our program, we serve meals during all of our sessions. So some people just want to serve and help that way. So we really have volunteer opportunities on every level where people can help. But the main thing that I ask for people to do is to, one way to help is when you see a news article or a news story talking about domestic violence, to look at it more objectively than perhaps you looked before. Maybe pass some information about SAFE or another program to your group or community group that you go to to let other people know that resources and help are available. Okay, great. Um, now, can you tell us a little bit more about what SAFE actually does? So you talked about the volunteers mm -hmm. doing training and that the clients actually will come in. So if somebody, first of all, uh, we're gonna bring your website up on the okay. screen and information will be at the end of the program. Um, so if somebody wanted to contact you guys to become a client, they need your assistance, what can they expect? Okay, well they would first leave a number where we could call them back on our 800 number and then someone will call them back if they don't, if the, or they can email us as well. But we have to have a way that we can let them know when our next training session is. But if they, don't, if they aren't able to be contacted, we can also work with them in other ways to figure out a way to let them know what's going on. So we have, that's one thing is we're very flexible. So we, we, we like to sit down with an individual and design an individual plan. Where do you want to go? What are you trying to accomplish? Some people, their goal may be, I need to get reunified with my children because I didn't have any resources and I'm homeless and I'm in a shelter. My children were taken away from me. So I need to you know, build myself back up so that I can be in a situation where I can get them back and we can be a family again. Uh, some people, you know, they just want to get out the situation or they need to just be more stable so or they want to go back to school so whatever their plan is so we kind of map it out short-term long-term goals then we couple the individual one-on-one -on -one sessions with our weekly sessions the group sessions and there's usually about 20 people that come on average and um, we'll have it around a different topic and we'll call or email and let people know you know the topic is this and so we might have a series around a specific topic and some people may be interested in it, some don't. And so we'll do that on an ongoing basis. Right now we're really pushing micro entrepreneurship because you know jobs aren't as quickly and easily to get as they once were. So in the meanwhile, you could think about something you could do yourself with maybe some resources or tools that you have um, right. access to. Right. A lot of service businesses, you know, what can I do? But 
let me think about it in a more professional way that this is actually a business versus it's just something hustling or a hobby I'm doing on the side or something right. like that. Okay. So now I want to be clear that the, the people that call you, and you do help um, women specifically, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. So the women that call you, um, it's not, you, you're not the emergency services. Correct. So if they do have an emergency and they need to you get out of the situation, like they need to call 911, um, or what are some other things, if people are in an emergent situation, what okay, can so you... Okay, it, it, so if they're in an emergency situation, like the abusers there, they're fearful of mm -hmm. their life at that moment, they should call 911 most definitely. If it's a situation where, you know, they are, they've went to someone's house or a library and they want to find where a nearest shelter is, then they can call us and we can help to advocate okay. to get them into shelter services. Okay. So we provide a lot of resources and why our program is specifically talking about the economic abuse component is each workshop, each contact, each conversation, we're integrating safety planning throughout the discussion. So we're talking about entrepreneurship, but we're talking about, okay, what kind of information do you put on it, the internet and social media? How do you keep your own personal information and your location confidential? Mm -hmm. What type of information do you put on your resume? How do you, what type of style of resume can you use that of, that might focus on the skills that you have versus a chronological resume that will show gaps in short term? So really looking at it from the perspective of some of the strengths and the weaknesses of the clients that we serve and how can we maximize what they have going on. Okay, great. Now, you had mentioned that you do some community events as well. Yes. Can you talk about the events? All right. So these events are like super awesome, right? So we do <laughs> these once a year, and it's Safe Health and Wealth Expo. Well, we, we renamed it. We rebranded our Empowerment Weekend now, right? So it's a two-day event. So the first day is on a Friday, and this year I think it's October the 10th. Don't quote me. <laughs> but it's like around the weekend, it's October, October yep. the 10th, right? And so... Um, this on Friday is specifically for 100 survivors of domestic violence in regards to micro entrepreneurship okay. and every year someone who went through the program and is now starting their business is the keynote speaker It's completely free of charge breakfast lunch supplies and other entrepreneurs speaking about how you can basically get started for nothing and it kind of kickstarts the program for the next year um, and then the next day on a Saturday is the Big Health and Wealth Expo, and that's a free event, health screens, free lunch, free community workshops, free massages. We had like 40 workshops, I think, last year. 750 people came out, a lot of giveaways and takeaways. And the purpose of that it was, was, is a domestic violence awareness event, but it's more than that. It's a community event where we help our community to be healthier safer and manage their money so the basic tenets of what safe does but expanded a little mm -hmm. but in every workshop in every pamphlet and flyer we give out is domestic violence information mm -hmm. so before every workshop is a little speech that's done about what is domestic violence how does it affect you and what you can do to help yourself or someone else you know so it's a way of us getting this message out there in a way that still engages our community and have them you know thinking about things in a different way and it's just really been exciting the feedback that we've gotten and how people are understanding how serious a problem it is and are now referring people to our program and are referring people to national numbers and hotlines and are and I've gotten response like I never thought about it this way and now I'm thinking about it differently and now my conversation is even different and I saw I know that we are doing the right thing that's great <laughs> and that's you know like we talked about at the beginning of the show how this is a community problem and when you put on an event that gets 750 people and you're having health screenings and a lot of vendors and 40 different workshops obviously you have community involvement yes so that's wonderful to see that at least some of the community gets it they get mm -hmm. that this is a community problem and hey we're going to all come together and we're going to do something about this and then you're reinforcing that with like you said the information that you and give it's out it's just awesome because we really try to think about it in a holistic approach so even you know we had one, a community partner giving bags of groceries so looking at kind of like the maslow of target of needs you mm -hmm. know starting with the bottom you know you need food yeah, and that's why we we give food at every session because how if you're, you're if you're coming from we don't know where you
you're coming from, from a shelter, from not eating all day. So if you're sitting there and you're hungry and your stomach is grumbling, you can't think about your safety plan. You can't think about what are you going to do next. So we try to meet those basic things as much as we can first, and then we kind of go up the chart and work on some of the other higher needs. Right, and that's and that's great. And what I'm hearing is, I mean, you had talked about how you guys are very flexible in working with the people, mm -hmm. but you can see that as you're talking about it, where you know that if somebody calls you, they may not have a phone. They right. may not have, you know, they may be in a shelter right now because that's where mm -hmm. they're safe. And so you're working with the people to make sure that you can get a hold of them, can get in touch right. with them. You know, the aspect of, you know, hey, some of these people may be coming, but they haven't eaten, so how can they concentrate? And right. so making sure that you take care of all of their basic needs so that you can help lift them up Correct. Is, is really great that you were able to see all of that and put that all together. And so, so it, it's so many other things we want to help with. And, you know, so we start expanding and, and doing different things and trying different things. It was even um, at different points, we'll go out into the community and do workshops on the east side of Detroit and the west side of Detroit and in, in the different counties because of the transportation issue. So mm -hmm. we'll, you know, so that's where we'll say, okay, we're going to be over here and do a special session. And so that's always successful too, mm -hmm. you know, because right now we're lo our office is located in Midtown. So that could be a challenge, even though we're off a of main, we're off the Woodward main bus line. Mm -hmm. But if we also offer sessions around the city, we found that to be really helpful too. Right. So what do you think the future holds for Safe? Ah, future hold for Safe. Let's see. Definitely um, expanding, mm -hmm. expanding as far as. Um, Helping more people, you know, and, and getting a bigger team, more volunteers, really um, getting our word out there, our message. And um, what I really, really want to see is us to have a, a training facility with a whole computer lab and, um, and, and just workshop, work labs where people could put things together and just, you know, do some trades or something. This is what, mm -hmm. I'm, what I see long term. So. Well, you know, sometimes you just got to put it out there yeah. and you never know who's going to be watching know. and who might be willing <laughs> to assist you and contact you and say, hey, we can make that happen for you. That would so, be awesome. So I hope that, I hope that you know, people that are watching um, want to get involved and make some of your long-term vision come true as well. So That would be great. <laughs> so do you have any um, final messages that you would like to get out to people? Um, yes. I, I would really like to first to just... I would like people to just be more compassionate towards one another, you know, whether you're in the situation or whether you know someone in a situation or you see it on the news, just think about that. It might be a lot more to the story than what you think and, and to be more compassionate to, to take time to talk to young people and tell them that they're important and that they, you know, that, that they're loved so that they won't look for uh, unhealthy relationships because it's really starting a lot earlier. So, you know, work with the youth so that I don't have to see them later. And right. talk to boys and girls about, you know, being healthy as well. So not just a warning to those who could possibly be abused, but, you know, strengthen up people so that they don't feel that they need to have, you know, power and control over another person that they could feel good about themselves. So that's, that's what I like to see. That's a great message because I think sometimes in our society that's so technologically based and so fast moving is that we forget that they're actually human beings next to us and a lot of people don't really know how to form that human connection anymore and if, if we had more of that and more of the community then you know hopefully there would be less of these yes. problems that are created if people just learn to you know learn how to get along with one another and respect one another so so i want to thank you so much for coming thank on you. the show and talking to our audience and um you know it's really a, a great thing that you're doing and it, it's it takes a very special person to be able to have that courage to go out and say I'm going to take something that was very personal that happened to me and turn it into something where I can help everybody else and so thank you very much for thank sharing you. your story I and for it. starting this organization. My story is just reflective of so many other people's stories you know people don't know that it actually affects one in four women domestic violence throughout their lifetime and you know so people feel that that's a problem that should have went away by now but it's still very much present unfortunately. Right. So, well, thank you again for coming. Thank you. And 
I just wanted to remind everybody that no matter the cards you were dealt or your current state of health, you have the power to take charge of your health. So never give up and never stop learning. The solution you seek may be just around the corner. If you can join me in a toast oh, to the yeah. viewers, yeah. we wish you a wonderful today and an even better tomorrow. Here's to your health. All right. Thank you.